I think it first starts with just our team, right? Um, we bring, you know, decades of experience, you know, having been, you know, coming together from like a lot of different backgrounds. And I think that's really key. We complement each other very well in that capacity. Um, you know, I think we also invest a lot in, you know, helping our affiliates and, and helping, you know, our partners grow. And that brings me to a good point. Like one of the things we're doing at Traffic and Conversions Conference uh, coming up next week is we're actually hosting a workshop. And so anyone who's run a DFO offer and who wants to come and sit down with myself, with Krishna, our CRO, with Jordan, with a bunch of our media buyers can come um, and meet with us and literally have us like look over your shoulder, help your campaigns and help you make optimizations necessary to, to get you scaled and get you profitable. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? We are live in the Ad Buyers Group here with Alex Brown uh, for episode, I think we're up to 57 of The Robust Marketer. Uh, I bet a, a lot of people in the audience uh, no, Alex Brown. Uh, he is the driving force, the, the marketing driving force, the CMO behind DFO Global Performance Commerce, one of the largest uh, e-commerce focused networks out there. They're not just a network. Uh, he spoke in Las Vegas and gave a riveting talk seriously on direct site buys and how they're a way that you're able to procure large amounts of, of high converting traffic independent of Facebook's algorithms. Uh, it was a big hit at the show. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for years. Welcome to The Robust Marketer. Alex, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, man. Uh, it's about time, I think. Yeah, good to be here. <laughs> nice. I first met you at Tim Bird's Mastermind in uh, Las Vegas last year, I think. Always in, La always in Las Vegas. <laughs> always in Las Vegas, that's right. Um, but tell us a little bit, tell us about, because you've been with DFO for quite a while now. You've sort of been, a, like I say, a driving force behind a lot of their international growth. Uh, talk about, about your marketers journey and how it's intertwined with, uh, with DFO. Yeah, sure. So I've, I've been with DFO actually just coming up on two years now. Uh, a bit of my background, I um, have been doing marketing in one way, shape or form for coming up on 10 years. Um, but when I really got into digital marketing was when a few of my friends started instantcheckmate.com. And uh, that was one of the largest background check, you know, digital subscription services in the world. And uh, they brought me on um, kind of as their, you know, junior media buyer. But uh, over the course of five years there, I, uh, I grew the company, I grew our marketing team and got us to a point um, where we were, you know, one of the most predominant players in the space. Um, but I got the opportunity to join forces with DFO back in 2017. Um, funny enough, I had been doing business with Gordon and the, the DFO crew. They were one of our affiliates for Instant Checkmate for many years. And Jordan and I just you know, got to know each other really well. And I, I really got to learn a lot about what DFO was doing. Um, I th thought they were a much smaller shop at the time. Um, but when I really started to uncover you know, what they were doing, um, their you know, e-commerce operations globally, it was just such a compelling opportunity that I, I couldn't say no. Um, and I had to join forces with, with them. So yeah, that was back in uh, May of 2017. And it ended up being myself and one other guy starting you know, a small little office here in San Diego. Um, but fast forward two years, uh, we now have a pretty cool office in San Diego. I'll show you guys right over here. You can see out the background uh, right here at Petco Park. So cool. Um, yeah, getting ready for baseball season. But um, but yeah, uh, now we have about 20 people here in San Diego, um, mostly internal media buyers, some front end uh, web developers, analytics folks, creatives, all of that, um, really supporting a lot of our you know internal brands and those of our clients. I want to talk about the growth, but first, just set the stage for people because not everyone might might know what DFO actually is. And I know you're multifaceted; you've got a lot of things going on under the hood there. But just give us the walkthrough of exactly what DFO is. Sure. So DFO, I mean, at you know, from the top level, we are a performance advertising network. Um, we bring to life e-commerce products, um, either for ourselves, owned and operated products, or for third-party clients who. Who come to us and, and we're really a one-stop shop so we can offer um, everything from product sourcing to technology we have our own crm 
that um, a number of very large e-commerce advertisers are currently using. Uh, it's what all of our internal offers are, you know, are supported by. Um, we also, you know, we're here for traffic, right? So we have internal media buyers. We also have a, a very large, well-known um, affiliate network that can help support uh, our partners as they scale into all sorts of different markets and different niches. Um, you know, we, we kind of have our hands in a lot of different cookie jars. How many different products do you have live on the network now? Oh gosh, I mean, I'd say over a hundred, um, but you know, I'd say a good amount of them, you know, it's like the 80-20 rule, right? So I'd say, yep. you know, it's, it's, it's a few select products that are getting the bulk of the traffic, but we definitely have a ton of different, you know, products live. And especially once you start talking about going international, you know, we are, you know, translating and basically rebranding these products for every specific market that we operate within. And so, um, you know, that obviously makes it pretty easy to scale <laughs> that way. Once you've set up that infrastructure. Correct. Yes. Very, so it's very easy fast, but it's, um, it's something that we're very, very um, adapt at. And, you know, we've, we've got a formula that, that's worked really well for us. And so, and then what's the approximate mix of network traffic that you're, that you're working with other media buyers on versus what the company does internally? I know that that might be proprietary, but give me a, a, a yeah, an yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's kind of a tough question to answer because it really depends on specific products, right? We have internal products that we, you know, are kind of only running ourselves. Um, we have agency partners that really will only work with us or the media buyers that are behind it. Um, but again, we, we do tend to you know branch out all of our products for for affiliates and third parties to run um, so it's it's kind of a tough question to answer but it, it's definitely a blend very cool so uh, now if, if you're we actually have we have quite a few viewers for this. this is awesome one of our one of our largest live streams we've had uh, so if you're in the audience and you've run a DFO a DFO offer give us a shout out just say yo I've run DFO I just I'm just curious to know how many how many people in this audience and that's when it comes to e-commerce entrepreneurs what are you finding among the people who run your offers externally? Are they entrepreneurs who already have e-commerce stores that are just that are using DFO products for upsells? Are they are they building their own brands but also running DFO stuff just because they're they're also excellent media buyers? Like what what's the breakdown of um, who runs DFO offers? Yeah, I'd say I, I'd say a majority of our third parties um, come to us because they know the offers that we have and we can offer are highly highly optimized and have you know sort of the you know the backbone. Mm -hmm. In order, in order for them to be able to scale globally. So I'd say most of our partners are coming to us and just running our offers kind of as standalones. In some cases, they're adding them to their own listicles. Um, but for the most part, I think people know that, you know, because we have an internal media buying here team here that's capable of testing and optimizing, sort of proving these deals out before we roll them out to third parties. I mean, that's a tremendous benefit. Um, and there's not too many networks out there that invest as much as DFO does into, you know, just making sure we have everything tested, highly optimized, and also that we're giving our partners like compliant angles that they can run. You know, we're not trying to let them, you know, give them some deal that's gonna get their Facebook account banned or cause them any issues. You know, our team is here to sort of do that heavy lifting before we roll the offers out to third parties so that they are, you know, they're, they just have a play-by-play -play book ready for them and, you know, to, to scale. What are some of the technical requirements now in terms of owning an offer? This, because I've actually never run, I've never run, I've, I ran affiliate offers back in the day. Like I'm from a, a classic affiffiliate network uh, from Neverblue. Oh, I know, Never, I know Neverblue well. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure we ran a lot of your uh, your info product, your info yeah. finder. Uh, but what I'm, yeah, what I'm interested in is, is yeah, what, what are some of the technical, like, is it difficult to run CPA offers on Facebook ads right now in its current climate? Or is it something that's still just, just pretty wide open? Well, I think it's interesting. Like you bring up a good point too. And I think there's been a lot of talk lately about, you know, white hat and black hat. And I mean, we don't really even look at, look at it that way anymore. We view ourselves, I mean, we're building e-commerce businesses, right? And so I think many of the, you know, sort of the methods and the angles that people have used for, a generation to you know get sales on a CPA and be able to arbitrage Facebook. These are techniques and strategies that can be that can be utilized in a number of businesses, right? But it's all about finding you know making sure you do it the right way, and that you know again you're not duping the consumer. And so I'd argue that e-commerce has somewhat gotten a bit of a bad rep in recent you know recent months or years because of 
you know, drop shippers or because of people not fulfilling products. And, you know, that's caused a lot of issues for, I'd say, anyone who's trying to get into the space as an e-commerce advertiser, because you sort of have to establish yourself first. And Facebook wants to work with brands. They don't want to work with affiliates, in my opinion. They want to work with, you know, businesses that are out there giving a good customer experience from end to end. And so as long as you're able to do that and you're able to invest in, you know, the resources necessary to support that, I think you'll be in a good place. It's, it's not really, um, you know, Facebook wants to work with businesses. They want to work with, um, and, yeah, and small businesses particularly and help people scale, but you just got to make sure you do it the right way. Yeah, I think I totally get that. Now, so, you know, I started at, at a network, we were uh, employee number seven. I was employee number seven and it scaled up within two years to 40 and then within another two years to 80. It was, a, it was one of the few networks uh, in its time that really like skirted the line uh, with, with, uh, with doing things the right way, honestly, doing, doing business the right way, running the right kind of offers. And in doing so, it sort of, it really, uh, it was a very like long-term network to work at. It was, it was, it was a really, really good experience. Um, but to beep through it, through the, those growth periods and to see so many other companies around fall by the wayside, uh -huh. uh, because because as a network, unless you're really investing into something very proprietary, you know you're a you're a middleman, uh, yeah. and so it's in so so I'm always interested in the networks that have risen above uh, to to be so so global. Like, what do you what do you attribute? You know, uh, what what has sort of separated DFO from the literally hundreds or thousands of other networks that have kind of fallen by the wayside? I also wanted to say quickly, you're talking about the quality of e-commerce products. You think about e-commerce, or you think about affiliate marketing back in the day when more affiliates were running you know, sweepstakes and things like that on Facebook's like, it's not comparable in terms of quality, even, even the lower quality. Not even that, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's all relative, it's all getting better. Uh, but sorry to interrupt the question there. What talk a little bit about what's sort of separated DFO over the years. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think it first starts with just our team, right? Um, we bring, you know, decades of experience, you know, having been, you know, coming together from like a lot of different backgrounds. And I think that's really key. You know, um, you know, obviously I come from a very different background than Jordan and then from Bruce and, you know, from some of the other key players on the team. So, you know, we, we complement each other very well in that capacity. Um, you know, I think we also invest a lot in, you know, helping our affiliates and, and helping, you know, our partners grow. And that brings me to a good point. Like one of the things we're doing at Traffic and Conversions Conference uh, coming up next week is we're actually hosting a workshop. And so anyone who's run a DFO offer and who wants to come and sit down with myself, with Krishna, our CRO, with Jordan, with a bunch of our media buyers can come um, and meet with us and literally have us like look over your shoulder, help your campaigns and help you make optimizations necessary to, to get you scaled and get you profitable. That so awesome. we'll yeah. throw a link to that. But, but if, if Christine is watching, she should, show, uh, she should throw a, uh, a link to that in the comments, but we'll make sure that's linked up because I think that's a really cool opportunity. Yeah, uh, not I mean, a lot of networks do that. Yeah, so I mean, th that's just one area. Um, but I mean, I think it's, um, you know, our ability to adapt, right? And if you, you know, kind of just keep doing the same old, you know, process and kind of keep throwing up the same type of offers, it's, um, you're going to get stagnant. And so we're constantly trying to improve and iterate. And we, we invest heavily into doing that, whether it's, you know, with human capital or with technology, um, we're kind of always on the forefront there. Um, you know, I, I think we also have a lot of integrity and that's something that goes a really long way in the performance marketing world. And, you know, I think if you asked anyone about our reputation in the space, you'd find that um, we get pretty glowing reviews uh, across the board. So, you know, those are just a few things. I, you know, I think, you know, our ability to obviously just bring the best, you know, offers to the market and our ability to really scale into international markets is what's kind of kept us at the, you know, the front and center. But um, that's kind of an ongoing process and something we're always investing in. So in San Diego, uh, so first of all, I'm going to tease to the end, cause I think a, a lot of the things that, a lot of questions that we get from uh, entrepreneurs are, uh, are, are about how to sort of train, retain, incentivize, uh, media buyers. And I think this is something that we get, we always get questions in the question and answer period about, about how to do this, how to balance incentivization, motivation with, with you know, keeping them while keeping them still working for your company, which is, you know, an ongoing concern. So we'll, we're going to talk about that at the end a little bit, but you led a little bit into the global opportunity. I know that's what you're going to be talking about uh, with Jordan Rollband in San Diego. Uh, so I want to just talk a little bit, like I think, and I've heard so many, you know, really good stories. I know my friend James Petrellis, who, who runs campaigns, who's, he's, he invested heavily into 
trans, you know, really good translation services and really tackling some South American markets. And he's made offers that, you know, I'm sure you guys have done the exact same thing that died out years ago here, go for another, you know, five years in, in other countries. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's this massive opportunity. Talk a little bit about your decision to, to, to do that. And then what have been the key things along that journey that have helped you do it? Yeah, so uh, I think the question is regarding like how do we, you know, how do we make the global scale and global opportunity work so well? Um, I mean, number one, I think it starts by having boots on the ground, right? So DFO has, I mean, I think it's like 10, it might be 11 offices now all around the world. And so it really starts by identifying, you know, what people in each of these cultures want, um, how they like to engage with you know, digital marketing and e even purchase products online. And until you really know that it's, um, you know, you can have a million challenges. Uh, and like, I could give you some examples, but you know, we've gone into other markets where we haven't had the proper, you know, local payment methods, or we've had blundered translations, or, you know, we just haven't been engaging with people in the way that they're used to. And so it really starts number one by having local talent. I mean, we have media buyers now in, um, in Amsterdam, in Vancouver, Vietnam. And so we like to have, you know, not just local media buyers, but people who can really just give us feedback on the local culture and, and what people want there. Um, you gotta have that Canadian feedback. Of you, know, you gotta talk the right way about hockey or you're gonna be in trouble, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but I think that's just one of the biggest mistakes people make is they, you know, maybe they'll have success with an offer in the United States and they'll see that it's available in Germany, right? And they'll just kind of dupe over what they've been doing here. And, mm -hmm. you know, we could go, we could talk ad nauseum about issues with translations and, you know, how people mess that up with, you know, Google Translate or things like that. But, um, you know, that's actually one of the easiest things to correct. It's much harder to really identify um, you know, how people like to, you know, engage with marketing and, you know, do they want somebody selling them hard and fast? Do you need to remarket them like 20 or 30 times, you know, um, to how do they like to receive communication? Do they like SMS? Do they like, you know, Facebook messenger? Do they want email? Do they want to call you? Um, so yeah, I mean, Jordan will tell you a, a funny story, uh, when we get on stage in San Diego in a couple of weeks. So I don't, I don't want to steal his, uh, his funny story, nice. but um yeah we've got many anecdotes on uh on some of the issues that we've faced over the years very cool and we will get into more in depth so that's what your talk in san diego is going to be a little bit on about how people can practically take steps to expand the success that they're having in their current market into international markets correct yes very cool nice well I, let's get in a little bit then to the media buying talent uh aspect i i you know you started you know, you started with this amazing product uh, back in the day. You had this really great success. And you said you were able to build teams around that build. And you were, it sounded like you sort of built out the own media buying teams as well as its affiliate program and, and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Talk, talk a little bit about your experience in hiring media buyers. And what's your sort of philosophy when it comes to hiring media buyers? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, and the truth is, is I've tried a number of different approaches to this. And I've found one that works best. I mean, there's really kind of a couple ways you can go, right? If you are maybe, you know, just just a business looking to expand your internal team, you can go the route of kind of finding people who are either former affiliates or, you know, kind of come from this performance marketing space. And, you know, I think that there's some challenges with that, um, especially when you talk about incentivization and just really kind of motivating people and, and you know, keeping them hungry and, you know, working hard for you 24 um, seven. But the other way that I found that, that I think works better is by really looking for young, smart people who maybe don't have a, a tremendous background in either digital marketing, digital marketing, or even performance marketing more or less, um, and really just bringing in them and training them. So I found that, you know, not to say I haven't had success hiring former affiliates. Like sometimes they, they work out great, but oftentimes I find that, you know, it's just very, very tricky to keep them highly motivated. Oftentimes they want to work different hours or they don't check in for a few period, you know, they're, they're entrepreneurs by nature. Um, they have so, that lone wolf aspect, whereas you're trying to build a team, right? That, that go, you know. Course. Yeah. And again, not to say that it can't be successful. I think it's kind of the, the mentality of, you know, do you want someone to come in right away and be able to, you know, just crush it right out of the gate? Or are you willing to invest a little bit more time and effort into 
training someone and training them up, you know, kind of in your image to uh, do things the way that you'd want them done. And I, it's definitely a much longer play to do it that way, but I've, I've found that it pays, you know, the biggest dividend. So what we like to do is we'll identify, you know, really, really smart candidates um, who potentially are, you know, just out of college or maybe worked, you know, in a sales role or something like that. Um, typically it's great if they have a background in like statistics or anything like data or analytical. Um, sometimes, you know, psychology works really well, but we'll bring them in. One, one interesting thing we did recently was we did an internship program and we basically found like about 20 or 30 candidates who were, you know, interested in working with us for like a three month period. And we brought them in and we did sort of like speed interviews. So we had myself and then like five other media buyers on the team and we had, we brought in like 10 or 20 of them a day and we had them meet with each of us for 10 minutes. We asked them a series of questions and then we gave them sort of like a logic aptitude test. Um, you know, some like word problem stuff, like, you know, a bat and a ball cost a dollar 10, you know, how much more does the bat cost in the ball, things like that. Um, and of that, we sort of all compiled our scores and then we um, made offers to the three best candidates. And of those, three of them came on board and joined our team for three months. They got to rotate, spending about uh, a month with each different media buyer. So one person on our agency, another who runs you know, all of our paid search, and another who does uh, Facebook. So it was during that time they each got graded by each of those media buyers, and then we, we hired the best one out of that. So. Um, you know, it's definitely, it's a long process, but, uh, you know, so far that, that media buyer has worked really well for us. And so that's a process we're looking to continue as we, as we go forward. But, that's a seriously good hack. Like yeah. that's a, not a hack. That's a, that's a great business strategy for, for hiring media buyers because I bet you had a ton of applications as well. I bet that, you know, just young people see, you know, advertising, digital, all these, these things yeah. that they're interested in, but may not know. But I remember when I got the job at Neverblue, it was like, I thought I was joining an agency. I had no idea what, what it yeah. was on about, but it was so attractive that, you know, that I could find a paying gig uh, yeah. in something that was remotely interesting to me, not government or, or something like that, that mm -hmm. I, I like fell all over myself to apply to it. So I bet you had a, a, some really good candidates. We did. And I mean, once they get to the office and they see, you know, the beanbag chairs and the keg beer on tap and everything, it's, uh, yeah. That it's it's an easy sell, but uh, versus you know, kind of bringing someone on who's you know used to that affiliate money, and maybe if they don't have success in the first like month or two you know, they're going to be looking for other opportunities or they're going, you know, they're just not going to be happy. And again, when you talk about building a team, you want someone who's going to be in the office at nine o'clock and, you know, available for all meetings, not someone who's There you are, Eric. I thought I lost you for a second. Internet issues. back there you are oh there we are internet issues are plenty these days and can't be hosting a podcast with internet issues are no of course i'll have to we'll trim that out in post let's <laughs> hear all my expletives and I'm freaking oh, okay. <laughs> nice um okay so yeah so talking about about the your your the, you know this 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 great sort of recruitment strategy that you're able to just like and that seems like something you could do at almost any size of an agency in a way right like whether yeah. you're an agency or a network like that just on a smaller scale it seems like that sort of Protocol well, would just be smart. And, and the way, the reason I like it too is because look, we all have like biases. And so oftentimes if I'm interviewing someone, I know in the first 30 seconds whether I like them or not. Mm. And that will sort of, you know, lead me throughout the rest of the interview, you know, already kind of having made up my mind. 
And so if you're able to sort of crowdsource it a little bit and bring in more people on your team, um, and they don't also have to be media buyers. They could be, you know, analytics folks. They could be web developers. But, you know, you want to build a culture where, um, you know, everyone likes and respects each other. And so I think that's, that's absolutely key. I mean, I would never want to just bring someone on my team who, you know, maybe I was a big fan of but didn't gel with our overall company culture. And so um, I think doing it this way, you know, tends to work. Nice. Um, yeah, that, and here's, here's a question specifically about, about media buying teams as well, and I've heard different takes on this. Do you, do you encourage media buyers to be full stack in that they're going to take an ad from concept to completion to, to editing? Or do you sort of break it up in more of like a Henry Ford style, uh, yeah. you know, where people are doing little bits of, of each part of the task? Yeah, so I mean, I definitely think that we've seen the most success when our media buyers kind of have their hands or at least their opinions in every step along the way, right? Because if you allow you know, a third party to go write a pre-sale page or write copy for you, but your media buyer is taking a completely different angle, um, those two things aren't going to gel. So most of the time our media buyers, I mean, they're responsible for building all of their own creative or writing pre-sale pages for, you know, AB split testing using EWO or other technologies that we employ. Um, so yeah, really, really everything. But the one thing I will say that we've started doing lately and we've seen better success with is we'll break up, we actually break up our media buying teams. So we have one team that's more kind of focused on sort of creative testing. And so these are like new offers that we're bringing to the market. Um, that really haven't been proven. And so we have a team just dedicated to that. And then we have another team that's really just, these are like our Navy SEALs, like our, you know, scaling revenue team. And so this team is really dedicated to just like producing revenue. So once we found an angle that works and we're really ready to like go from, you know, a thousand bucks a day to like 10 or $20,000 a day and spend, we will, um, we will sort of pass that off to the team that's, you know, more capable of, of handling that. Um, and so, yeah, people can graduate from one team to the other. Uh, it's just depends on, um, you got to sort of earn your stripes. Uh, but that's, that's working really well for us. I really like that. And, and, and that was a question I was going to ask you next, because you talked about like including sort of analytical aptitude tests. But they're really, you know, it's, it's rare, I find, to find a, a marketer who has both that like deeply analytical, curious side, mm -hmm. as well as the sort of creative side where it, where it really comes into, you know, that ability to come up with new angles and new yeah. turns of phrase that, that sell things. So it's interesting that you guys split that. Do you guys screen for the creative aspect at all when hiring? And how would you do that? Yeah, well, I'll say this, like if I had to choose between one or the other, if I, you know, would could find someone who is much more creative and have to teach them the data analytical side or vice versa, I would, I would be much more steer towards finding people who are data driven and analytical because the creative side, most people have it, right? Most people, they just, maybe they don't exercise it enough, but if you give people like a whiteboard and a pen and you start, you know, spitballing ideas, I think you'll find that there's a, you know, a tremendous amount of creativity that people actually have. You just kind of have to mine for it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's the, the short answer is no, we don't really like screen for it that way, but um, I think we can teach it. That's really interesting. I, and I like that. Like, and, and a really analytical person also will be so curious about ways that they can improve the numbers that they will just even almost mathematically tweak the language and the creativity and that aspect of things. Like maybe they're not a, you know, this idea that you don't have to be a creative savant. You just need to be curious really. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we do have, I mean, because, you know, we have a large media buying team, like people are constantly sharing ideas. And so if you're a new buyer who's coming in and, you know, maybe you're picking it where you've been given a campaign and you've been told to, to run it, there's plenty of help. I mean, we bring in, you know, um, sometimes like three or four buyers to work on a specific campaign. So we're kind of like, Again, crowdsourcing these ideas and not just giving giving it to one person and letting them be the you know thumbs up or thumbs down on the the death of the campaign. Uh, you have to have a couple of different sets of eyeballs on it. Um, so yeah, I mean the more the more different angles and approaches you can take, the better, and that's how we typically test. Very cool. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the life cycle of an e-commerce offer at this point in the game. What what like how are are your offers sort of like month after month churning along are they are, are do they burn brightly and fade away like because i know as as I, you know i was talking to some friends pre before this who, who run dfo they run other sort of network offers 
And the sweet spot is always being able to find an offer, or they tell themselves this anyways, the sweet spot is to be able to find the offer before it's really blown up, but it has the potential to blow up. And just talk to me a little bit about that offer life cycle that you see. Yeah, well, I think again, one of the great things about DFO is that these offers are available in like, you know, dozens and dozens of countries, right? So what's what we typically like to find is, and I mean, look, every, I think every offer has a life cycle, right? And what that really means to someone is, you know, is it going to be like an instant plug and play slam dunk where you're getting, you know, 50 or 100% ROI or, or more, you know, right out of the gate? No, I mean, and oftentimes we have to change angles or we have to change different approaches to get something to work. And I think that's, you know, pretty standard across any type of offer. I mean, I ran instant checkmate for five years in one market in the United States, and we were, you know, blowing that thing up you know, day after day after day, but you just had to take a different creative approach. Um, and so, but the great thing with DFO offers is that because they're available in so many different markets, um, again, what we typically find is if it's a good product and it's something that has universal appeal, like a TV antenna or like a shoe insole, like things that people just use in general, um, you can just continue to scale into new markets and kind of like, you know, build something brand new um, every time you launch it in a new market. Now you have to be, you know, obviously concerned about the translations and all the things that we sort of talked about earlier um, in order to make sure you're getting your message across and it's, you know, resonating with the, the audience in that market. But, um, but no, I mean, I think we, we have a number of offers that have been on our network and have been live for, you know, two years plus and are still doing, you know, several, several thousand uh, sales a day. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it just definitely depends, but I wanted to ask, is it a requirement of a product that comes on your network that it has the potential to scale to multiple geos, or are you also working with sort of more niche products that sort of, you know, maybe have a, have a bigger brand identity, but they don't have the, maybe they don't have the same potential to scale, or is it sort of a real requirement that you look for things that can go global? Um, I definitely say we look for it. I wouldn't say it's a requirement. I mean, for some example, like we have insurance providers or we have like health insurance things that you know aren't necessarily an e-commerce product, but they're brands that we're bringing onto our network that can only be run in the United States, right? So in that capacity, we're you know we don't really have any ability to take them internationally. But for you know e-commerce brands that are coming to DFO to work with us on our technology and on our back end and through product sourcing. Yeah, I mean that's typically a big reason why they why they come on board is because you know they know we have the ability to scale them internationally. Um, but yeah, it's it's not a requirement, but it's certainly something that you know we we can add value and we can help businesses grow um, by taking them abroad. Very cool. So that's something. So if you're in the audience and you're either looking for offers to run or you have an offer that you think has the potential to to really scale, and you're looking for a scaling partner. DFO would be uh, an amazing person to talk to here. I, I know. So one of the things I like about you is you're a CMO and you're, you know, you're, you know, a growth engine for this company, but you still also, you're a hands-on guy with your marketing. Uh, you still got your hands on the campaign. I, and I, you know, I really enjoyed your talk in Las Vegas because it took me back to when I was making direct, you know, when I, I made a Yahoo mail monster site buy on Valentine's Day one day for, for bids.com. And I, and I remember, and I was, it was what I usually had CPA deals in place, but for this one, it was just a straight CPM deal. And I was just like hit and refresh like crazy. I want to know what, in terms of media buying, what's, what, what is firing up you most, mostly these days? Yeah. Um, I mean, we are, I mean, we're definitely doing a lot of those direct site buys, um, you know, big takeovers on MSN, AOL, um, and a lot of smaller, more niche sites in both the United States and also abroad. Again, that's another reason why it's so important to have local talent. Um, if you're trying to reach out to direct sites in Germany and you don't speak German, um, good luck. <laughs> it's, uh, it's tricky. So, um, you know, we've seen, you know, those have just been incredibly successful for us. And it's kind of our framework for, um, again, getting evergreen, consistent traffic through. But, um, you know, I'm definitely, you know, spending some more time getting on Snapchat. I know everyone's, you know, pretty, pretty keen on that these days, but we've started to see some success there. Um, and, you know, we've sort of shifted, I'd say a little bit more of our traffic now is going to Google. Um, just we've had, you know, just like everyone else, like, you know, Facebook is, you know, constantly presenting new, new challenges, but also new opportunities. And so um, we have just amazing Google reps right now who are just so helpful and have really, you know, taken us um, and, and a number of our offers um, from, you know, 
a couple hundred sales a day to a few thousand. And, you know, that's just been really, really positive when you get that sort of um, just the personal touch and, and people really, you know, wanting to help you and wanting to help you succeed. Um, yeah, we, we love our Google reps. So they've been great to us. That's a great shout out. AdWords is sort of consistently one of the top, uh, the top sort of asks that people have. Uh, so I'll, I'll say too, if you want, if you can work some AdWords content into your speech at all in uh, in San Diego, I think I think it would go over really well. I wanted to ask if you tried YouTube. I've done some. I've been doing some of their sequential advertising mm -hmm. uh, for for this event, actually serving people sort of a sequence of of, of, of yeah. um, you know pain point addressing videos essentially to get them to come to the event. Uh, what's what's been? Have you done much YouTube advertising? I, I haven't. You know, I haven't. It's probably the one traffic source that's just like eluded me for so long. Um, I know there are people out there that are doing just a, big things with it. It's just never been something I've really made work. Um, you know, we spend much of our resources on you know the GDN um, and paid search, and you know that's just sort of been our sweet spot. So um, we just kind of keep doing what works for us. It's it's just amazing that there are these new front new old frontiers as well, right? Like yeah. you have this business that's truly global. And, and you know that, you know, there are all these other traps. Have you done anything in Snapchat? Is that something that's working for you? Yeah, so, yeah, and I, I sort of mentioned that earlier, but we, um, yeah, we're, we're sort of just getting into it now. Um, you know, we tend to skew a little bit older with some of our demos. So, um, you know, 45 plus, um, they're not, you know, incredibly present on Snapchat, but I mean, if you can get the right, the right CPMs and the right rates, I mean, we can tend to find a, you know, sort of a niche for anything. So. Yeah, we're definitely investing more in Snapchat these days. Millennials probably don't even know what a Tiva antenna is. <laughs> we're teaching them. We're teaching them all about it. <laughs> for the for the post apocalypse, when when the yeah. cable stations go down, you're going to need that. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. But, well, nice. Well, if anyone here in the comments has any questions, we can certainly address those now. Let's talk like what like let's talk a little bit about Las Vegas and San Diego. Like it was just awesome having you there. It was such a cool experience. Uh, what was your takeaway from that show, and why you think people should be joining us in San Diego? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, both the Facebook Mastery and the Ecom Mastery were, I mean, incredibly different events and in kind of incredible, you know, different, very different arenas. Um, I mean, you number one, you just can't beat the lineup. I mean, getting speakers such as you know Tim and and Nick and everyone like that. Um, I mean, everyone who bought a ticket there got value. So um, you know, I was sort of a fanboy in the back, just like listening in to, to everyone's talk. But um, no, I mean, I think the San Diego show is going to be even better. Um, obviously, it's in my backyard, so excited to have everyone here. Um, we do have the Ad Buyers Meetup, which is going to be great. That's at Omnia, um, their rooftop on, I want to say, the 27th. Um, so that'll be a great time for everyone to come together, and you know, they can ask me any questions that they have, or um, yeah, share some, share some tricks and tips and everything like that. But um, it's going to be good. That's awesome. Yeah, the, the Ad Buyers Meetup is always a highlight, and I think there's a link in the comments here. So if you're watching this and you're coming to San Diego, definitely RSVP for the Ad Buyers Meetup. It's just a awesome. You know, usually there's some aspect of open bar, and you're you're meeting all these other amazing ad buyers, and, and it's just a really a really great time always. Uh, so highly recommend that. Definitely check out the workshop. Uh, that DFO is putting on, especially if you're running DFO offers, and if or if you're looking to get into them, uh, go be a part of that because that sounds like an amazing thing. Um, what else? What's uh, how was your Valentine's Day? My Valentine's Day was good. I, I was actually in uh, Vail, Colorado, with uh, my wife, and decided to actually bring the whole family along. So um, yeah, we got some great snow, and uh, yeah, it was a really really nice time. Nice. Okay. There's one more topic that I'm interested in. You know, we talked a little bit about the data versus creativity. And so, uh, Jason Krisky is someone I'm close friends with him and I know he's putting a big bet on that creativity is going to be, uh, something that, that like that, you know, ads need to be focused on in, in the future and that, and that eventually media, a lot of the levers, the analytics, the media buying will be sort of subsumed by smarter pixels and by, mm -hmm. by better algorithms and stuff. What's, what's your take on the future of performance marketing? Where do you see it going? Yeah, I, I think I've sort of, I've heard this um, theory, but um, yeah, I mean, I think consumer psychology is obviously a, a really big passion of mine and trying to figure out, you know, why people do things. Um, and I don't know if I think like a computer will ever sort of be able to come in and sort of replicate that, you know, that process because, you know, it's just like, you know, sociology in general, like people, 
people, if you tell somebody something like I'm going to make you think of like an elephant, you know, in like 10 seconds, right? Like the, the consumer's mind has already, you know, gotten around that and gotten ahead of it. So, you know, I, I think there will always be a place for, you know, the creative media buyer in the space. But look, as, you know, technology is evolving and, you know, you know, these uh, algorithms are getting smarter. I definitely think that, um, you know, we will be given more and more tools to help us do our jobs better and, you know, more efficiently. So, you know, as soon as, you know, lookalike data, you know, evolves into, you know, even things that, that Amazon is doing right now with some of their technology, um, I, I think we will be poised for, you know, definitely bigger and better things. Yeah, I'm, I, I, and I, I think Shopify is is starting to look at their affiliate program too in general. I'm really interested to see what they do in the affiliate space because they're like the 800 pound gorilla. Definitely, definitely. Very, very cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the Robust Marketer today. If you do, if you catch this late and you have questions for Alex, I'm sure you can drop them in the comments below. Uh, make sure you RSVP for our event, uh, Facebook and E-commerce Mastery Live, as well as the Ad Buyers Meetup as well as the DOFO workshop. This is just fixing up to be an incredibly intensive, awesome you know, week in one of the best cities in America. Yeah, we look forward to having everyone. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be a great week. So uh, I'll see you all there. Awesome, well, say hello to Jordan Rolban, who is also going to be speaking in San Diego, who couldn't make it today because he fell ill. But I'm super excited. He was great in, uh, in Bangkok on stage. Uh, and I'm excited to see the damage that you two can do up there. Looking forward to it, man. Thanks so much for having me on. Okay, cheers. Cheers. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming by. Make sure you go to iStack.link slash San Diego to grab your tickets. We have under 50 tickets left uh, for this amazing event, so you do not want to be left on the outside looking in. Um, if you're going to traffic and conversion, there's really no reason you shouldn't stick around for this amazing event. You will get your value 10 times. If you don't get your value of the show and you want to tell me about it, then we will give your money back because I don't think it's, I just don't think it's possible. Uh, but I want to thank Alex again for coming on and uh, look forward to seeing him and several of you in San Diego. Cheers.